In today's episode of Pros vs. Ams, we want to try something a little bit different. Normally what we'll do is we'll show you a typical movement pattern for an amateur golfer. Then we'll compare and contrast that with what a typical professional golfer does. Now there's a lot of benefit in that because it helps to shape your concept for these given movement patterns. But today we're going to change that and do it a little bit differently. We're going to take you through the actual lesson we have with this AM. We're going to show you the swing that he started with. We're going to show you the issues that came from that swing. And then most importantly, we're going to show you the progress throughout the lesson. You're going to learn what he was feeling. Then you're going to see what he was trying to do to make the changes. Then we're going to share with you the pro swings that we used in this lesson to really help this golfer achieve the changes that you're going to see at the end of the video. We see so many golfers struggle with this same issue and we thought it would be helpful for you to see the actual progression of changes that we made in this lesson so it'll be beneficial to you when you're out there working on your own swing. So just to give you a little backstory before we jump into the swings, what we typically do is when a golfer comes in for a lesson, especially for the first time, we'll have him warm up and hit balls and as he's doing that, We'll ask him questions to try to find out the real reason why he came in and what his goals are for the session and going forward. Our AM, and we'll just call him John so we don't have to keep referring to him as the AM, was in his 50s and he was a tall, good athlete and a single digit golfer. Now he described his game as being a scratch short gamer with a double digit long game. As he was hitting his last few warm balls, he looked over and he saw that we were looking at a few of his previous swings. And he goes, I know what you guys are looking at and I know what you're gonna to try to do. You're gonna to try to get me, just like everyone else, to stop thrusting my hips towards the golf ball in the downswing. Then he laughed and goes, good luck with that. My response was, all right, if you're loose, let's get you suited up so we can start capturing your swings and show you exactly what it is you're doing. And that's where we're gonna pick up this video. We're gonna show you the very first swing we captured then take you through the progress of the lesson and the changes that he made. You're looking at the first swing we captured with John. His comments during the warm-up were telling, and he was right. It does look like he shoves his hips towards the ball in the downswing, but that really wasn't his problem. As he's hitting, he's telling me that he's never seen a swing of his where he didn't see his hips thrust forward towards the golf ball, and that's all that anyone's really tried to fix with him. And he also felt like that he was a good enough athlete to get away with it most of the time. What he was most concerned with, however, was about how flippy and timing dependent he felt at impact, you know, hitting through the ball. He felt if he could get more open, he would have more of a stable release and with that, better misses. Then he told us every time he had tried to get more open, things got worse. And that's the real reason he came in. Now let's take a look at what's happening in John's swing that's causing the things he didn't like feeling or seeing. Really what it boiled down to was John had a flawed way of thinking about his rotation, specifically his pelvis rotation. The pelvis has so much importance on what happens above it that when it's off and not moving well, the rest of the swing becomes a series of compensations and saves. John's first issue was here in his setup. His hips were way too far behind his ankles. This is such a common issue we see at least once a day, and it almost guarantees that you'll shove your hips forward during the downswing towards the golf ball. You're seeing John now compared to some of the best ball strikers in the world. Notice where his center hip line falls relative to his ankles. John is used to setting up with little to no bend in his ankles, which forces the hips back. Notice the ankle bend and resulting forward shin angles from the pros. That's what allows them to position their hips over the ankles here at setup. And this is John's before and after. He went from the setup here on the left to the setup on the right. This is important because at one point or another, you're going to find this balance. It's better if you do it here at setup so it doesn't change your spacing that you created at setup during the golf swing. So that's the first thing in getting your hips ready to move correctly. It's getting them set up correctly. This shouldn't tax any of your talent reserves to get this right. So no excuses for having poor pelvis alignment at setup. Next, we looked at his takeaway. When there's a problem with the hips, it's usually easy to spot right off the bat. So here you're looking at John and one of our tour pros. This is from the behind angle. And with gears, we can put this vertical plane behind the golfers or the sheet of glass as we like to call it. And this is the same plane that you saw from the down the line view in the last segment. Most golfers have their hips slightly open at setup and you can see the evidence of that with their left cheeks pressed slightly against the glass. As these guys start moving, you're gonna see 
two distinctly different movement patterns here on the glass. The pro has fingerprinted the glass by rolling his left cheek over to his right cheek, just as you would if you were having your finger printed. By contrast, John has completely lost his contact with the glass. But remember, John started with way deeper hips, so he pretty much forced himself to lose contact with the glass when he started moving. Then as we let these swings play through, it shouldn't come as any surprise to see the rest of the hip movements continue to do opposite things. So anytime we see a golfer struggle like this in this Windex test, 99 times out of 100, the golfer is putting a poor concept into action. We showed John a swing from this overhead view and asked him to kind of describe what his pivot feels like or how he's trying to pivot throughout his swing. He said, I'm trying to pivot around my right hip in the backswing then pivot around my left hip in the downswing. That's pretty much what he was doing, or at least as well as it could be done, and he was also paying a penalty for it. We call that the wrench pivot because one of our golfers a while back said he felt like he wrenched around his right hip, then quickly tried to wrench around his left hip. The two big problems with the wrench pivot is what it does to the center of your pelvis and the time it takes to do it. We'll use John's swing here to explain what we mean by that. So this line you're seeing in the screen here now is gonna trace the movement of the center of his hips. This line is the trace that's drawn by the center of the hip throughout the golf swing. Notice how the idea of pivoting around his right hip forces the center of his hip to make a beeline straight out to the golf ball. That center of the hip has already moved two inches forward by the time his club reaches the end of his takeaway, and that's when the club is parallel to the ground. That's why we saw him lose contact with the glass here at the end of his takeaway. And this is the so-called early extension. This is when it starts. This is what causes golfers to thrust their hips toward the golf ball in the downswing. And you can see here how early that fault happens. It happens at the very beginning of the backswing. But because golfers are pivoting around their right hip, the right hip often stays on that butt line until the downswing starts when that right hip starts to rotate out towards the golf ball and that's when most golfers think they early extend, think it's a downswing fault. But as you can see here, it happens very early in the backswing. Then as he nears the top of his swing, you can see how there's no way you can recover from this move. It took three quarters of his one second. That's all we have in the golf swing from address to impact is one second. It took three quarters of that one second to get to the top, and that's pretty standard across all golfers. It's just not something that you can really successfully recover from in a quarter of a second downswing. In fact, I can't really recall a golfer who so-called early extends who didn't make this move early in the backswing. And I really can't recall one either who successfully recovered from it. You can also see the damage this does to his ability to rotate, which as we found out a little while ago was the real reason he came in. His hips are 18 degrees open here at impact. His chest is 14 degrees open and his shoulders are 15 degrees closed. And that's why impact feels so bad and flippy to him. John was a classic example of this issue that we see all the time. But here's a look at several other golfers who have the same issue and what that looks like for their swing. After understanding what the bad concept looked like, John said, show me what I should be doing instead. We showed him these next three pros that you're gonna see so he can get a really clear image of the right concept and the correct movements. These three guys represent over $100 million won out on tour, over 30 wins and six majors. These are about as good as it gets for seeing how the pelvis should move during the swing and how to visualize the rotational pivot point of the hips, both back and through. Notice the commonalities here. They have a small lateral shift to the right at the very beginning of the backswing. Then they rotate around the center of the pelvis. They shift back towards the target as the pelvis is still rotating close. That's a big deal for most golfers. Notice how they're not 
rotating to the top of the backswing, then shifting forward in the downswing. They're shifting forward as that closing rotation in the backswing is still happening. Then they continue to rotate around the center of pelvis in the downswing. So the major difference in what you're seeing here and what we saw in John's swing is that the center of the pelvis pretty much moves laterally without that big move towards the golf ball. Dr. Kwan calls this the shift, rotate, shift, rotate pelvis pattern, and it's something we see in the best players time after time. Now John's light bulb was really burning, and he said, so you're telling me all I have to do is feel like I'm pivoting around the middle of my hips? That seems way easier than what I was trying to do. So with just that simple thought in mind of rotating around his hips, from his new setup, and without a golf club, we had John make some slow speed back and forth pivots. His only thought was trying to feel the movement of the middle of his hips in space. Closing his eyes was a big help for him. Once he felt he had a handle on those movements, we put the club back in his hands and had him make some swings, but still going slow. Once he felt good about moving with the club now, we allowed him to ramp up the speed as he started to hit balls. We also started capturing his swing again so we could begin to anchor his feels to the reels. Here are the progressions of his pelvis trace, which is all that we worked on as he worked through the process of changing this movement pattern. This was the first swing. Instead of a vertical move straight towards the golf ball, he has a little forward component now to that move. Still no move away and still too much movement out towards the ball, but you can see it's getting better. Here was his second swing. He took off 20 miles an hour of club head speed just so he can get back to feeling a more exaggerated movement with the center of his pelvis. And here's his third swing. Now we're back closer to normal speed, only now he's using that breakaway move off the ball at the beginning of his swing. And this is swing number four. Call this the bear hug swing. Full speed now with the exaggerated feel from the previous two swings. Now he's completely reversed the movement he had when he first came in. This was the first time I'd ever been given a hug during a lesson. He said he had never seen himself make a swing at full speed without any sort of props or chairs or alignment or training aids without seeing his hips thrust out towards the golf ball. This swing was the first time he had seen that. This is swing five. This was the fastest swing of the day so far by three miles an hour. He's starting to get the feel for it without the exaggerations now. And swings six through 37 pretty much all look like this. He really had the feel for it. He was really starting to reproduce it on every swing. Because we were keeping his focus and feels on just one thing, he had totally forgotten about trying to get more open or be less flippy through the hip. He had forgotten all about it, but we didn't. This is swing 38. His speed had gradually increased from 83 miles an hour on the first swing we captured that day to 92 miles an hour. These were all seven irons, by the way. His pelvis trace had completely changed, which was his only focus. His hips went from being 18 degrees open at impact to now 33 degrees open. His chest went from being 14 degrees open to now 23 degrees open. And his shoulders went from being 15 closed to now square at impact. That's the big one. And that was the real reason impact felt so terrible to him. Having his shoulders square stabilized his release and gave him a much better club path for the shots he wanted to play out on the course. So that's it. In 38 swings, John gave himself nine more miles per hour of club head speed. He completely changed his concept of how to pivot and that allowed him to change his movement pattern in a big way. He got rid of something he had given up on. He had given up all hope of not thrusting towards the ball in the downswing and he gained something that he had been trying so hard to get. He's now more open and rotated than he's ever been before. He did it all without a drill or without a training aid. His process was to adopt the right concept, then slowly build awareness for how those movements differed from what his normal was. He also gave himself permission to experiment and exaggerate, but most importantly, he kept a singular focus on the cause. John's original hip movements is one of the most common issues in the golf swing that we see on a daily basis. Hopefully this will help give you a better understanding and a visual of how to go about making these changes in your own swing. John's a great example of taking some of what the best in the game do and applying it to his own swing. You can do the same thing. 
Don't just settle for what it looks like on the TV screen. Try to really understand and find evidence of what it is they're actually doing. You can turn that into real tangible results just like you saw John do here. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did enjoy it, go ahead and give it a like. Also, if you have any questions about today's video or you have an idea of a video that you want us to shoot, go ahead and leave it in the comments below. We read every single comment. We also respond to the comments. So again, leave us a comment if you have any questions or if there's anything you'd like to see. Now, if you haven't already, click the subscribe button. We have videos coming out every single week and we don't want you to miss one. So by clicking subscribe, that ensures you're notified right away when a new video comes out. And hey, if you want to add instant distance to your drive, and we all do, everybody wants more distance, go ahead and click the link in the pinned comment below. You're going to see a link. Click on it. It's going to take you to a page. You're going to enter your name and email address. We're going to send you an email where you're going to get access to instant distance, which is a video training that we put out. We know it's going to help you. We know we're going to see you farther down the fairway.